pleasure to be here. Can you hear me? Okay, good. And um, <clears throat> so first I apologize, uh, I'll have to look at the recordings, but uh, as I said, uh, I just came back from Stanford, so it's still a bit confused in my mind, but I hope the talk will be uh, to the point. It's a great pleasure to talk at this meeting in honor of uh, John. Actually, my first meeting with John was not with the person, but with his book, What is Mathematical Logic? Uh, in my student days, uh, I was exposed to a lot of different logic lectures, and I found it very hard to see uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, a, a grand picture. Maybe this was also because I, I was taught by ruthless proof theorists, and especially by Professor Curry. Uh, of course, whose formalist view of uh, mathematics extended to the, the point that he didn't believe in motivations. So, uh, that, you know, you could take a whole course with him and not see the grand picture. It was John's book that actually made me see a perspective on the field. Then, uh, as was mentioned um, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting John uh, in India, I believe it was. Uh, and. Um, I, I noticed that the author was as nice as the book. This is not a given, but it's very pleasant in those cases where it actually happens. So um, uh, I really appreciate John's work, uh, John's person, and the opportunity to be here. Having said that, uh, let me um, uh, start talking about um, <clears throat> my topic for today. So I'd like to talk about um, uh, conditional statements. Um, so even though John's book is about mathematical logic, uh, the topic of conditionals actually straddles the divide uh, between mathematical logic and philosophical logic. And the number of things I'm going to say are usually more put in the area of philosophical logic, even though to me that borderline is extremely thin. Um, <clears throat> so I probably don't have to convince you that conditional statements are uh, crucial everywhere. It starts with your own children when they're very young, uh, just listen to parents in a playground, what they say to their children, uh, it's all promises and threats. Like, uh, you know, if you behave, you'll get an ice cream. If you don't behave, then uh, something else will happen and so on. So from a very early age onward, uh, our lives are actually structured by conditionals. It may be one of the first things that children actually learn because uh, yeah, it gives a sort of handle on behavior. Maybe later, although logicians would like to think that, of course, what we do comes first, uh, conditionals also have an abstract use in hypothetical reasoning. And that's, of course, also crucial to, to many things that we do. Uh, they provide a form of mental simulation. Uh, we, ca we can think about certain eventualities based on the antecedents and then think about what would be the case there. And that's, of course, crucial de to decision making as we compare different scenarios. Um, not surprisingly, then, um, there's many, many logical construals of uh, what conditionals actually mean. So statements of the form if A, then B. You could go in proof theory, well, lambda calculus, uh, 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 things like that, or you can go to the semantics. And one thing that I find interesting is that new analyses and perspectives on what conditionals mean keep emerging. What I want to do today is actually just follow, it's not going to be very systematic, I just want to follow two threads of thinking about conditionals that may be a bit less uh, familiar to you and that I think are worth pursuing or adding uh, to the many approaches we already have. So the first point I'd like to make is that um, this is a very old idea that um, <clears throat> if you want to understand what a conditional does, there's actually something dynamic about it. So a statement like if phi then psi, it can be seen as what the antecedent does, it, it describes an action, something that you do. And the psi describes an effect. So if you wanted to put that in, forms of, in terms of logical syntax, you could think of the logical form of a conditional if phi then psi as follows. Um, my hash phi is just some operation, something that you do, uh, having to do with the content of phi. And then the brackets are from dynamic logic. So what they say after you've done that, whatever it is that you do with phi, um, uh, psi will be the case. Which actions are described by this hash phi? Uh, well, it's not necessarily one thing. 
For instance, the if could tell you to just suppose it, and maybe the weakest sense for that is just what you would do, say, in natural deduction, you add it to uh, the, the set of assumptions that you have. It could also mean something like imagine. Imagine that you're actually in a place where phi is the case, that's richer in a way. It could also mean some sort of restriction, like uh, among all the things we're looking at, let's now restrict attention to the phi's and so on. In any case, um, there's more structure here than just adding an assumption in a proof, even though, of course, uh, the proof theoretic analysis or the standard proof theoretic analysis is very rich and, and of course, uh, the, the, the great abstraction. 1.2 One point to make about um, once you look at things this way is that, um, and this is, I call this an old view, so you, you, I could give you lots of literature where this dynamic view of antecedents uh, arises. Um, one point to make is just at this very abstract level that if there is this sort of dynamic view of antecedents, then a lot of things that people say about conditionals, especially in the philosophical literature, has to be uh, looked at a bit carefully in terms of what are we describing when we talk about inferences uh, where the antecedent is involved. So let's take an example. Uh, suppose that you say, if phi and alpha, then psi. What is that and? It could be the Boolean and, so then you, you're performing your antecedent action on the conjunction phi and alpha. So if I now were to go back to ordinary um, conditional notation, that would actually be the formula between brackets if phi and alpha, Boolean conjunction, implies psi. But it could also be the end of and then, so the end of action, which you would find in programs. So then it would be after first performing the if action for phi and then for alpha, you have psi. If I were to write that, I would actually get a stacked implication. So if phi conditional, if alpha, then conditional, then psi. These things are not obviously equivalent. They are equivalent in some classical proof systems, but they're not equivalent in other systems of the sort I'll talk about briefly. Same for disjunction. So when I say phi or psi in the antecedent, what am I talking about? So it could be the if action on the disjunction phi or alpha. And again, I, I won't repeat, but you, on the next line gives you the formula for that. But it could also be that it's the or of choice. Then we're talking about an action. Well, again, the sort of non-deterministic choice you might find in programs. So then the conditional is actually of the form uh, after the choice action, suppose that phi or suppose that alpha, psi is the case, which actually in dynamic logic of programs would amount to saying that if you have phi, then you have psi, and if you have alpha, then you have psi. One more example, what does monotonicity mean in this perspective? Well, again, it can mean two things. It could mean that if you have two premises, that you then uh, say that the, the if action for the conjunction phi and psi uh, implies alpha, but it could result in alpha. Or it could mean that um, you do the two things one after the other. So I hope you see that even though it's a very abstract viewpoint, it makes a difference. And we'll see some examples later where it makes a real difference. If you want to do conditional logic at this abstract level and do justice to both the uh, uh, dynamic view of the antecedents plus the Boolean structure that I talked about, you could actually do a sort of minimal modal logic for each operator, if phi, and then put on top of that propositional dynamic logic or some program logic that uh, uh, deals with this. That will actually give you actions for dealing with the antecedents. I've written them down here. These are standard. And it's an interesting perspective to think about. Um, <clears throat> for instance, you might ask yourself, of course, in real programming, uh, the most important operation is the star, because the star is what allows you to uh, actually write something short, but let the computer do a lot of work, like in while uh, loops and so on. Um, I'm not completely sure what um, putting a star on an if action would mean. It would be you keep supposing. Uh, so uh, yeah. The, uh, I'll leave that uh, for uh, you to think about. Now, this dynamic perspective is natural, but can we say more about what antecedent actions do? So 
So now I go to uh, some standard topics from philosophical logic. One of the most influential views of what conditionals mean uh, goes back to Frank Ramsey in the 1930s, and it's called the Ramsey test. So the way you evaluate a conditional is as follows, according to Ramsey. Uh, you add phi, the antecedent, to your stock of beliefs. Okay, So that's like maybe adding an assumption to a proof, but you do something else. Namely, it may be the case that if you do that, that the resulting set of uh, uh, propositions that you end up with is inconsistent. And Ramsey says, now you should do something. So before you actually start talking about what the consequent side does, first, you should perform a minimal change to make your new beliefs consistent. Of course, if, they, if the assumption phi is already consistent with your beliefs, there's nothing you need to change. Then you can just see whether psi follows in some classical sense. But otherwise, Ramsey would say, first, make your new beliefs consistent, then see if psi follows. This is a very interesting intuition about what conditionals mean. It means something like, you make the supposition that phi, and now you should aim for arriving at some sort of new equilibrium in, in, in your thinking. And it's only when you a stable place or equilibrium. And once you've found that, and it should be consistent. And once you've found that, you're gonna look at whether that is the case. And this idea was taken further, and, and that's the most famous semantics of conditionals in the philosophical literature by David Lewis in his famous uh, closeness semantics. So technically what you do, this is from the 1960s. So what you do is you take models with a ternary order. So basically from the viewpoint of each world, you order all the other worlds. And now you're gonna say that at the world S, the, uh, the conditional if phi then psi is gonna be true. If, I see there's a typo here, sorry. Uh, if MT satisfies psi, so it's not phi, the, the second phi should be psi. For all points T that are maximal in the ordering from the view, point of view of S inside the set of uh, the, uh, the phi points, or just to put it in simpler terms, um, the conditional if phi then psi is true at S, if all the phi points that are closest to S in the ordering uh, given by S satisfy psi. So a conditional means go to the closest points to where you're where you currently are and check that psi is true there. That's Lewis semantics. It's been criticized a lot, it's been discussed a lot, but I think it still sets the standard for about everything you would want to say. There's a complete base logic for this semantics. Um, Lewis gave one uh, which is a somewhat simpler completeness proof where he also assumes connectedness of the ordering, which I didn't assume in what I said so far. But uh, the complete logic was axiomatized by John Burgess and Frank Feldman in the 80s. And uh, here are the principles. So <clears throat> some of these principles are just the obvious ones for the consequent. So if you have phi, then you have phi, uh, you have conjunction, you can weaken it. Um, the differences with classical conditionals come in manipulating the antecedent. Well, actually, D is not a difference because that's just disjunction of antecedents. Um, and C, E is very famous. Uh, generally speaking, this closeness conditional is not monotonic because if you look at the, if the closest phi worlds are psi and you now strengthen phi to phi and alpha, then you're looking at the closest phi and alpha worlds. But that may be an entirely different set from the closest phi worlds. So the fact that the closest phi worlds are psi doesn't tell you that the closest phi and alpha worlds are psi. But there is a remnant of monotonicity called cautious monotonicity, which actually does hold for this semantics. And, and this is, of course, something that will be familiar to all of those of you who actually know something about default logics or non-monotonic logics. Basically, what it says is you can strengthen the antecedent phi with con conditional consequences of phi. So that's the uh, base logic for background. Actually, a small aside, uh, one problem with the Lewis semantics is that this maximality intuition or minimality, in case you, you minimize or maximize along an ordering, um, uh, what do you do when um, the, uh, <clears throat> there are no maximal phi points? So uh, Lewis himself had a very nice example. Uh, suppose, look at the conditional, if I were taller than I am, 
what's the closest for that, right? 183 plus epsilon plus epsilon divided by half and so on. Uh, there is no closest uh, world above, say, where my height is greater than I am. I'll just say that there are some common fixes for that. So you can make what's called the limit assumption. You can also work with more general uh, truth conditions uh, than uh, the one which I gave earlier. Uh, in fact, that will be my own preferred style, but it's not relevant for what I want to talk about uh, next. Um, and in fact, I'll return to this point because uh, one of the things I like about uh, if you just wander along some paths and logic is that sometimes things that look like problems can actually become beneficial properties. So we'll return to the issue of what happens when there are no maximal or closest worlds. I'd like to know, <clears throat> so that was my second point. My second point was just, um, if you want to say a bit more about what um, antecedent actions are, you could look at what Lewis semantics tells you to do, which is move to the closest finite parts. But I want to make it still more concrete. So that's my third thing I'd like to present to you. So what actions could this if action be? Well, at least one source of very concrete examples arise with information update. And I'll discuss two examples, hard assumptions and soft assumptions. And we'll encounter two issues. One is, uh, what is the nature of the assumption action? So the if phi. And an issue that will also come up in a moment is, what's the effect of the psi? How strong do we want to make what we say about the consequent psi? That will. So before I can make this more concrete, I have to say just a little bit about uh, updating semantic information. So semantic information you could think of as um, information that agents have, which is given as a range of options. So a very old idea, it goes back to Carnap and many others. In our simplest case, let's just think that the range of options which the agent sees is the domain of the current model, or a set of worlds if you're thinking modal style. What the agent knows is what's true in all the options, so everywhere in the model. New information updates the current model. So if I have a certain information range, I'm thinking about you know, the various uh, things that might happen this afternoon. So maybe I see five scenarios. These are my five options. Then actually new information like uh, right, uh, uh, it's going to rain uh, might actually cut down the five to three because three of the two of the scenarios might be baking in the sun, you know, which will be impossible. OK, you see what I'm saying. A more detailed analysis of this, this semantic information idea can be found in epistemic logic, but we don't need much of that to make to do my illustration for conditionals. So let's suppose that the if action was actually an update action, an update action with true information. How is that modeled in the, in the epistemic logic version of semantic information? So you have a current model M and an actual world S, maybe not seen by the agents, but, but by us as modelers. You can think of that model as a group information state, or maybe for uh, my presentation today, just think of the information state of one individual. If you now learn that phi is true, or you update, then in the simplest case, you eliminate all not phi worlds. So here's the picture. Uh, your current model has uh, phi worlds and not phi worlds. So phi could be the statement that uh, it's raining um, or it will rain this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> S is your actual world. I drew S in the phi area. That means that phi is actually true. And the update will actually change this model or restrict it to the set of all points that satisfy phi. So you only keep the phi points, you eliminate the rest. This elimination, of course, is very strong uh, uh, epistemically because what it means is there's no trace of a doubt that perhaps not phi might be true. So that's it's deleted. So this is sometimes called hard information. So phi is treated as if it's absolutely reliable and correct. So that's maybe the simplest model of information uh, update. 
And here's a logical system for talking about it. It's called public announcement uh, logic. And basically what you do is you take statements from epistemic logic, like what agents know, which remember in my simplest case just meant true everywhere in the model. And you add dynamic modalities uh, after getting the hard information that phi, which is often called a public announcement of phi, psi is the case. So you recognize our conditional again. And the Pell semantics says that in a model M, uh, this conditional is true at S if, assuming that phi is true, this is the, the writer for uh, making sure that we're talking about true information. If phi is true, then actually in the updated model, so after you've performed the change, you have psi. So on the dynamic view of conditionals, the if phi action is now the update from M to M restricted to phi. And then what were the, what psi, the consequent describes is what was would, would be the case in that new model. After you had actually learned that phi was the case. Here's a complete action system for uh, uh, the public announcement logic. And uh, I'll, uh, I won't go into details of that, but um, <clears throat> I want to look at this a bit for uh, in an unusual way in terms of what sort of conditional logic this is. So remember, so my box announced phi psi now is the conditional. So what do these various actions say? Well, basically uh, I give myself all proof principles of the basic modal logic for each conditional, you could say dynamic conditional. So that fits really to some extent with Lewis's logic. If you look at C, you will see another principle that uh, was also there in the conditional logic of Lewis. So uh, you have aggregation. So if phi then psi and if phi then alpha is equivalent to um, if uh, phi then psi and alpha. Then there's also <clears throat> one for knowledge or if you wish the universal quantifier or modality in our models, that's D, which I, I won't go into. But uh, I want to comment a bit on uh, B and E. Um, maybe first B. So B is actually a bit of an unusual principle for, you might think, um, namely what it says is that if phi, if phi then not psi is equivalent to if phi then, well, there's actually a recursive clause in here, but um, okay, let me go to my next slide and you'll see what it says more or less. Um, what that action actually amounts to is saying that this, uh, after uh, updating with phi, you have psi, or after updating with phi, you have not psi. This is very strong. It's much stronger than what Lewis uh, actually had in his logic. It's actually um, what was proposed by uh, Bob Stolnaker a bit later, around the same time as Lewis in the 1960s, in his view of conditionals. Because what Stolnaker thought was that the if actions are deterministic. So if you make an assumption that phi, you arrive at a unique world. Okay. So not a range of worlds, a unique world. And you just, so you could model check whether psi is true there or not. So that's interesting. The conditional of public announcement logic is actually more like a Stolnaker condition. And um, there's hardly any inferences in the uh, left-hand position for the ifs. So um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just give a few examples. Uh, uh, this would become too detailed, but um, on the right-hand side, it's all okay. But on the left-hand side, for instance, uh, just take my third line. So um, the dynamic conditional after uh, announced phi psi does not imply, so it's not standardly monotonic. It doesn't imply that if you announce something stronger that you have psi because it could be that you announce something which leaves a certain ignorance. But if you had announced more, the ignorance would have been removed. That's basically what my blue uh, counterexample says. Um, <clears throat> there's actually a sort of interesting issue. Soon you will get into technical issues here. Um, what that suggests is actually a sort of study of which monotonicity inferences are allowed in dynamic uh, logics of uh, information update like this, but that's an open problem. 
So we don't have a Linden theorem for PAL. And also, I think we don't have Linden theorems for conditional logic in general. More can be said, though, because we could think, well, yes, but that's monotonicity. What about cautious monotonicity? Because that's the only thing that Lewis has. Actually, that is not valid for this conditional either. So um, I, I'm not going to go through the counterexamples, but I can post my slides and then you can read uh, what I say about this. And, and neither sense, in fact, of the monotonicity, uh, of the cautious monotonicity will hold in, the, in this system. Whether you take it in the Boolean sense, that's the first one, or whether you take it in the uh, sequential composition action sense, uh, that's the second one. So we get a sort of uh, different conditional from the Lewis conditional. Here's maybe one more thing that's interesting to point out. Um, because on the other hand, this system actually does validate some things that um, you don't have in the Lewis logic. And this has something to do with iterated conditionals. So look at the, the one but last line on this slide, which I'm showing you here. So this says, Psi is an effect of first getting the information that phi and then getting the information that alpha. Many people think that that should be about the same as getting uh, that psi would be the case if you get the information that phi and alpha together. But from a sort of information update point of view, that's not right. Because um, what's described here is that you first tell somebody that phi, that already results in a new information state. And then you tell the person that in that new information state, alpha is the case. That's not the same as the Boolean conjunction saying that right now, phi and alpha are the case. And in fact, the correct axiom is the one which I described for you here. What it actually says is um, the effect of two of these statements are, um, is gonna be equivalent to saying that you announce the following. Phi is the case, and after you've learned that, how far is the case? That's your action or your assumption. And then psi will be the case. As a small aside, um, this action well describes the behavior of one colleague of mine who at department meetings never wanted to hear others. So he would always say his own thing. And then he would say, and then if I say this, Johan will say that. And basically he ran the whole conversation, so to speak, before I got a chance to say anything. So this was all stacked uh, things of this sort. From a conditional point of view, that's actually a very interesting action because uh, what it says is that the stacked implication, if phi, then if alpha, then psi, is equivalent to the implication if phi, and then the conditional if phi, then alpha, uh, then psi. So uh, in other ways, uh, the update conditional uh, it brings us into thinking about iterated conditional statements, which is actually a notoriously tricky area in terms of intuitions. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about this. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this, yeah, but maybe one thing I should say. Um, so I've been talking now about making assumption actions concrete by viewing them as update actions. In fact, one particular update action, a public announcement or public observation. But what about the consequence? How strong do we want to make that? What the earlier formulas do, like uh, after announcing phi psi, what they actually say is that after the information that phi has been given, psi is the case right now. Well, that's local. So what we could also do is give the consequent a more universal force and actually say, after the information that phi has been given, psi is true everywhere. So that's maybe closer even to the Ramsey test. Now, I'll just state, and now things come apart. So for instance, if you now go to a principle like cautious monotonicity, you will actually find that with this increased force for the consequent, um, one version of cautious monotonicity is valid, namely the one in terms of stacking actions, and one is still invalid, the, the one in terms of Boolean strengthening of the antecedent. Open problem for you and for me. Uh, Actionatize the complete abstract conditional logic uh, that lies in public announcement logic. 
Uh, this, this requires some abstract techniques, but I don't have time to go into this. And in any case, we don't have the result. We neither have it for the local version nor for the global version with you. Okay, so that was the point I wanted to make about. So what happens then, conclusion, if you actually tie speculation about what the if action might be to a very concrete scenario, namely current logics of information update, what you actually find is you are going to find conditional logics that look a bit like what uh, Lewis has considered, but not quite. On the one hand, they miss some principles which Lewis has, like uh, cautious monotonicity. On the other hand, they validate some principles which Lewis doesn't have, like one's governing iteration of conditionals. So, okay, interesting. Now, this I'm just going to skip, I'm, I'm afraid for, um, uh, well, maybe I do have time. Um, how much time do I have? I have 50 minutes in total, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, so you have 20 more, 20 more minutes is fine, I think, uh, if you go even four minutes over time, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes, and, and please also do whatever it is you need to do as a chair to stop me and, uh, you know, no keep worries. me in hands. Yes, okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now, of course, it, these public announcements, so exclamation mark phi, I just one very particular way of uh, thinking of antecedent actions as information update, because it's, as I said, about hard information. Um, that's one thing. But also what I said so far about local and global effects are just one way of uh, thinking about the force of the consequence. Because you might also think that um, maybe the operative notion in what you want to say about the consequent is not this U operator, which I had for this universal modality or universal quantifier for knowledge, but that it, it could be just about belief. This is interesting. And of course, I realize I'm in the presence of historians who know a lot more than me, but I've been reading some texts about um, ancient Buddhist logic where in the context of some project we're running in Beijing. And actually one very curious thing is that in a lot of this early literature, uh, conditionals and also what's considered valid reasoning seems to be of the following form that um, uh, if you grant the assumption, then it will induce a belief in the hearer. So that, that's actually what logical laws do. It doesn't induce knowledge, it induces belief. So this is, of course, at a stage in history where the difference between logic, if you wish, and uh, persuasion or rhetoric isn't, isn't all that clear. And um, in that history, by the way, our ordinary notion of logical consequence does come up eventually, but much later. Anyway, that, that, this is an aside. So we could look at different forces for the consequent, but my main point here is we can also have options for the force of the antecedent. For instance, um, instead of this hard information update, we could also think that if I consider if phi is the case, I might do that in a weaker sense. Namely, um, I'm not assuming that phi is actually true, but I think it's become the most important thing for me right now in my considerations. These softer assumptions don't eliminate worlds, but they just reorder things. So as an example, uh, well-known notion, radical upgrade. So what radical upgrade does is, um, <clears throat> uh, so you see this upward arrow with uh, a, a different upward arrow. Um, it makes all the phi points more plausible or more prominent than the not phi points. So the not phi points are not eliminated, but they're just put below in the ordering. They're not our primary concern right now. And uh, so basically, yeah, the, the, the phi points become the most relevant ones, the most plausible ones, no matter how you want to call it, the closest ones. Um, that, of course, would lead us to an enormous area of thinking about what sort of conditionals we would get in this way. And generally speaking, I think that the, the study of conditionals in this sort of dynamic update setting is actually at the same time the study of the varieties of information update that we might want to consider. That's all I'll say about this point. I could say more, but I want to move on. Now, <clears throat> So I started with Lewis semantics and uh, uh, these minimality or maximality clauses. 
And um, then I started looking at information update as a very concrete way of thinking about what if actions might be. So by now I might seem far removed from Lewis's closeness intuition. So I just want to point out that that's still relevant in, in the sense of, yeah, to me, a sort of unresolved but, but interesting issue in thinking about information update. So can we also see um, a, a dynamic conditional, like the, the one I, I spent some time on here, right, as a closeness conditional? So um, notice, remember what the semantics did. It would actually take the current model M and it then went to the updated model M restricted to phi. Okay. And yeah, is there closeness involved there? If you want to make that precise, you need to introduce a notion of relative closeness among models. And this is actually a sort of intuition which you find uh, again and again in, in, in the literature. Uh, shouldn't we actually try to metrize the model theoretic universe, for instance, so that it actually makes sense to say in the sense of some appropriate metric that the updated model M restricted to phi is actually the closest model to M where phi is true. Okay. Of course, and then we need to do something because what, what's a natural way of, of uh, you know, putting an order or a metric on, on the models? Of course, that's been considered in, in, in lots of, uh, I think, uh, areas in logic, but um, it would also have to be done here. This fits with a widespread intuition concerning update and revision that um, if you update with phi, you move to a closest point in the relevant state space where phi is true. For instance, there's a very nice book by uh, Sven Ova Hansson on information updates, which, which develops that point of view. The only problem is, and that's why I only tell you about it, I don't think there's a generally accepted approach to doing this. So I think at some abstract level, you could think of these update logics as actually living in a sort of model theoretic universe where there's a metric or a natural metric or a natural closeness order, but I'm not aware of any, as I say, generally accepted proposal for doing that. And um, yeah, thinking in those terms. Okay, so open problem. I come to my last topic. <clears throat> uh, so once again, I hope I said this clearly enough at the beginning, I'm not offering you uh, sort of deep results or some sort of coherent theory. Um, uh, in this talk, I just want to wander along some uh, lines of thought and, and see where they take us. So I started with conditionals as a, a dynamic view, where the if the antecedent actually has something to do with an action that you perform. I suggested that, um, that in the Lewis view, that action has something to do with moving to some closest point. And then I looked at uh, update logics as, as very specific, concrete uh, implementations of that idea. Uh, my last thread of thought is actually that closeness metaphor has something spatial to it. So uh, the last uh, uh, thing I want to present is actually what would happen if we actually interpreted conditionals as spatial operators in space? By this time, I think we've left the original philosophical logic motivation for thinking about conditionals and we're moving just into questions of mathematical logic, namely, um, what would be the conditional logic of space? And I just want to give you some observations and speculations about that. So for instance, we could think about real space and geometric conditionals. So let's think of, since we're talking closeness, um, <clears throat> here's one way of thinking about this. So we're actually in space and uh, let's say you're clearly in space, maybe you just wanna think about the plane and uh, we have a Turner relation of uh, relative closeness. So C, X, Y, Z means that Y is closer to X than Z is, the circles give you a picture. This was a very nice primitive, um, the, the first order properties of binary closeness. Well, uh, what's actually not that hard to see is that if you look at the complete first order theory for this, it's Tarski's elementary geometry, because both Tarski's betweenness and Tarski's equidistance can be defined in terms of relative closeness. 
Um, so that's a full first order theory. Um, there's also an open problem, as far as I know, which I'm glad to hand to you. Uh, if you just want to actionize the universal first order theory, uh, I think that's unknown <laughs> what that is. Uh, you, you don't immediately get that from Tarski's actions. But notice that on this interpretation, the earlier problem with maximality of the Lewis conditional is now not so problematic. So <clears throat> take a, a conditional statement like phi implies a contradiction. So what that would just mean on the original Lewis semantics is that there are no closest phi points. Okay, that's just what it means, right? Because it's, it, it, the Lewis closeness uh, analysis is all the closest phi points satisfy the consequent. But the consequent in this case is a contradiction. So there are no closest phi points. Of course, in space, this is not problematic at all. You're immediately reminded of a topological notion like closure, right? It just means that, you know, the, the five points keep approaching you arbitrarily. So in other words, in space, uh, even the original Lewis definition doesn't, it actually seems to describe interesting uh, <clears throat> patterns. Now we're in the area of logical space, which of course have been uh, considered from lots of points of view. I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, topological interpretations of intuitionistic or modal logic, which, which would actually uh, yeah, describe structures in space. So I want to suggest that it's also interesting to uh, look at conditionals in this setting. Um, actually, if phi implies false, it does not say that you're actually in the, topologically speaking, that you're in the closure of phi, that would be wrong, because it, what it could be is that you have a circle of not phi points around you, and the phi points just approach that circle arbitrarily, if you think in terms of distances, right? So you could actually be in a this sort of, yeah, that, that's, so many circle points can be the interior of not phi. It's actually interesting to think about this a bit because, um, <clears throat> For instance, suppose that that's the case. What that means is that for each point on that circle, uh, on the boundary of that circle, um, uh, <clears throat> so the five points uh, approach uh, arbitrarily. So, um, okay, I, I should think what, what was this argument again? Uh, yeah, so then, <clears throat> What that actually means is, I think, uh, that the circle must have limit points. Of, uh, uh, why do I say many circle points can be here? Uh, um, this is another typo. Uh, so after compactness, it, it, it has to say that the circle must have limit points of phi. Um, if something spatial comes in. Uh, suppose that this circle didn't have uh, uh, limit points. Then for each point of, on the circle, there will be an open neighborhood. Uh, which was entirely uh, uh, not phi, yeah, so that, that's actually true. But then we would have an open cover of the circle, and by compactness of the space, there would be a finite open cover. I think I'm wasting a lot of time here. You could ask me about this in question time. Okay. But I'm, what I'm saying is that compactness of the space will actually give us limit points of um, uh, phi, not, not phi. Um, in any case, I hope this shows the connection which I try to demonstrate here is this. If you start thinking about what conditionals mean in space, you actually quickly get into issues of mathematical properties of space, like compactness. Also, the conditional itself, of course, and more generally, not just the phi implies false, but phi implies psi, has an interesting meaning. And um, so basically what I'm suggesting here is that if you do that, then uh, it will be of great interest to actually think of conditional logic as a spatial logic. And it adds something to the usual topological interpretation of the modalities, because by talking about closeness, the conditional actually talks about the metric structure of the space. So that leads to all sorts of questions. For instance, here is one of the of course, most basic features of uh, metric spaces, uh, the triangle inequalities. Um, you can read this on my slide and uh, I'm not gonna spell it out, but what the triangle inequalities do is 
uh, they tell you how closeness is related from different viewpoints. So if you know some closeness from viewpoint of X and from viewpoint of Z, then you also know it for Y. Um, one question, this question is actually from an old paper I wrote in the 1980s, which I've never been able to answer. Um, is there actually any conditional logic action that corresponds with the geometrical triangle inequalities? I actually don't know. And here is your open problem. What is the complete conditional logic of the real space? So, as I said, I think that's an interesting addition to topological logics about which we know a lot. And it's actually a bit surprising that as soon as you enrich the language with uh, notions like conditionals that could refer to closeness and hence to uh, metric structure, that we know so little. I'm going to skip this slide, but this is actually for extending this point of view a bit, because I don't think if you do this, you should just add a conditional. You should actually also add further notions that um, uh, talk about closeness structure, like uh, spatial versions of until and so on. But I think I'll just show you this slide and instead try to uh, move towards um, uh, a conclusion. So um, the point in this part was, so I do something, you know, maybe it's not so very motivated, but it seems to me like a natural move. Um, we start in closeness semantics. Obviously, Lewis-style closeness is very abstract. We could make the closeness a bit more concrete by talking about update logics, where we'd have to retrace the space of models, and, and ho hopefully the metric would correspond to something reasonable in terms of uh, update. But then I just make a step and say, yes, we could do that. But why don't we also look at what conditionals would actually say in the heartland, namely just standard space? Then you could think of conditional logic as it, it's actually a bit uh, tricky. It's not a fragment of Tarski's elementary geometry because um, these modal logics also have unary predicates. So they actually are sort of fragments of the monadic second order logic over um, uh, of uh, Euclidean space. They're fragments in the sense that their quantifier structure is simpler than that of Tarski's elementary geometry. But on the other hand, what makes them a bit more complex is that in Tarski's geometry, you don't have uh, predicate, unary predicate variables for subsets, but these modal languages do. So you know that's something for exploration. I could point out more results about this. It's, it's, there are actually some interesting results on, on this style of looking, but um, I think I'm, I'm going to leave it here. So what I've suggested here is that actually also pursuing just the real spatial interpretations is of interest. And that in that case, some things that might be problematic in the philosophical discussion of conditionals, like the lack of maximality, would actually just be interesting features of the spatial structures. Of course, I'm reaching my uh, end point. Um, <clears throat> so I started by talking about the dynamic view of conditionals, then, I, then closeness, then space. Of course, we could also combine all these themes. For instance, uh, I could go dynamic again and uh, ask myself, uh, what are natural dynamic operations on geometrical spaces? Well, that, that may be something for discussion. So my conclusion. Um, maybe I should start at the, I've given you a simple walk in the, along this issue of what do conditionals mean? What surprises me about conditionals is that it keeps getting discussed. So in some sense, you could say a lot of the history of uh, philosophical logic uh, and maybe also mathematical logic is actually about how to handle conditions. And <clears throat> if you, walk along those themes. Uh, you, I've offered a few more perspectives that are maybe not as widespread as others that you may know. One is that you could see conditionals as a sort of dynamic modalities, but the dynamics has to do with the antecedent uh, actions. There's variety of antecedent actions and consequent effects. So this may actually explain why conditionals are so widely debated and why it never seems to stop because it may be a very complex notion with a lot of varieties. 
I've suggested that updates involve minimizing along ordered models. And that immediately also leads to technical questions that are open as far as I can see. Uh, how do we want to introduce closeness orders on the uh, space of models? And uh, by that time, yeah, that's what I said there. And finally, I've suggested that concrete spatial models make sense. Maybe not from the original philosophical point of view, but just because it makes sense to look for that sort of patterns in space. If you do that, um, you'll actually cross between what's usually called philosophical logic and mathematical logic in a natural manner. And to me personally, actually, I don't even see what that boundary is. Um, uh, if you take one topic like conditionals, uh, there is no divide. You can actually go this way, you can, can go that way. And I think also notions and insights uh, from both sides uh, are actually going to be helpful. So I want to stop here. Um, I'm not at all sure whether I've managed to please John in uh, taking this subject, but I hope it gives an impression of what I like about logic. You start thinking about one topic and you open your mind to all sorts of perspectives that you could have um, from uh, you know, the, the history, from various technical tools that you have. And uh, I hope I've also shown that if you do that for conditionals, there's a lot of things to think about including a lot of open problems. Thank you. Fantastic. So that was a wonderful talk.